Well, I am delighted to be here. I really appreciate it, and what a great setting that we're at here to, to have lunch and for me to do the presentation. Uh, I'm on the board of directors and past president of the 306 Bomb Group. I'm also an ad hoc advisory member to the board of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And it's the mission of these organizations to remember, honor, and educate. To remember the air war over Europe, to honor the men who fought it, and to educate the public about it. And a few years ago, that became my personal mission. And as uh, Brent alluded to, I go all over around the United States signing copies of my book, talking about the 8th Air Force to people. I make PowerPoint presentations to all sorts of organizations. Uh, actually, most of the groups I speak to uh, aren't that familiar with the 8th Air Force. I don't know much about the air war over Europe. So my presentation is geared more toward the uh, general public. So there's a couple little portions of the presentation to probably some of you that are very knowledgeable will be pretty rudimentary, but uh, bear with me as we go through those. Growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. Uh, his plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. Flew bombing missions over Europe in, in February of 1944. His plane was shot down and he was missing in action for seven months. But he evaded being captured and eventually made it back to England. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I had the time to really delve into my dad's history in more detail. My uh, parents had kept a lot of material from the war years and I just wanted to go through that and organize it and learn more details. And at that time I had no intention at all of writing a book. There were two items that, uh, they, that they had that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down, and it's absolutely riveting, uh, so much so that it was included in two books that are written. Uh, on the left is uh, The Mighty Eighth by Gerald Astor, and I noticed it was on your t the, the table here today. It was about the uh, Eighth Air Force who flew daylight precision bombing missions over occupied uh, Europe and Germany. Their first mission was on, on August 17th of 1942. And the goal was to hit industrial and military targets to cripple Nazi Germany's ability to wage war. Uh, the 8th Air Force got the moniker Mighty 8th uh, by the noted historian Gerald a uh, uh, Roger Freeman because of the number of planes they could put up on missions, which numbered into the hundreds. And on December 24th of 1944, 2,000 bombers hit targets around Berlin. I mean, I get excited when I see one B-17 up, up in the sky or a B-24. I, I can't even imagine 2,000 bombers, you know, some of, them were, some of them were dropping their bombs around Berlin, other bombers were still taken off from England. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the other book was First Over Germany uh, by Russell Strong. It was about the 306 bomb group that my dad was in. Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306th and became his historian after the war was over. Uh, the motto of the 306 was first over Germany because they were the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany, Wilhelmshaven, on January 27th of 1943. The other item that was really significant were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England before his plane being, was shot down, and also letters from other members of the crew and members of uh, relatives of the crew. And reading those letters were just really moving, and a lot of excerpts from those letters are included in the book, which makes it uh, very personal, personal. My dad was really candid in what he wrote in his letters. So he talked about what bombing missions were like, what life was like on the air base, what life was like in London and England at the time, escapades of him and his crew. Okay, I'll try to talk a little louder. And reading those letters was absolutely fascinating. And I became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and spent countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents, mission reports, squadron di diaries. I went on a quest to find relatives of all my dad's crew and asked them what information they could give to me, pictures, newspaper articles, letters, start going to World War II reunion reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories, and finally, 
Two years or three years into my research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told. So I decided to write a book. From the time I started my research to the time the book was published was for four and a half years. Uh, it took me 12 months to actually write the manuscript. And then to publish it, I formed my own publishing company called Seabreeze Publishing, LLC. Seabreeze is the name of the street that I live on in, in, in Seal Beach. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as editing the book, uh, cover design, interior layout, uh, the printer I used, the company I used to print the hardcover books in Michigan, the fulfillment house I used to store and uh, to ship the books in Indiana. And uh, it's carried in many of the air museums across the United States, the World War II Museum in New Orleans, the uh, Air Force Museum in Dayton, and of course the Mighty Eighth Museum in uh, Georgia, in Pooler. I love the Mighty Eighth Museum until COVID hit. I'd go down there every February on Super Museum Sunday to sign copies of the book. And as Brent said, I've made uh, two presentations there so far. One, so far, one is this presentation. And then after I made a trip to uh, England, Belgium, France, and Germany in 2019, I made another presentation. And then this Wednesday, I'm making a presentation about all the locations that are still there in Belgium where all the events took place. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the first half of the book builds up to the day that the plane was shot down, and then the second half of the book is all about what happened afterward. And it's just not about my dad, but it goes into detail about what happened to each member of the crew, because it's something different happened to each guy. And also it's about all the courageous Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them. Uh, the story is entirely based on first-hand testimony by the people who were involved in the events that took place. What I added was just a great deal of historical information and anecdotes about and surrounding the war to put it into context. But I probably wouldn't have written the book, come on, if it wasn't for two Belgium gentlemen. On the left, you see my dad with Dr. Paul Delahaye. That picture was taken in 1994 at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and my dad's plane being shot down. And then on the right-hand side, you see myself with Jacques Lelot. That was, picture was taken 20 years later at the 70th anniversary. Uh, during the war, these two men were young boys and they were greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand atrocities committed, committed by the Nazis against their family and friends. And later on in life, they became local historians. And they interviewed all these Belgian people, members of the Belgium underground, about events that took place involving my dad and his crew. They documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information about events that would have been lost forever without their dedicated research. So I owe them a huge debt. Uh, Dr. Delahaye uh, passed away in 2013, but Jock's 85 now and a dear, dear friend of mine. Initially, my dad didn't go into the Air Force. As a result of the first peacetime draft implemented in September of 1904 by President Roosevelt, my dad went into the Army and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. At the time, the U.S. military was woefully weak when World War II started. They ranked 18th in the world in military strength behind Romania. And they were also very ill-equipped uh, at the time, as you can tell from the World War I vintage uniform that my dad has on here. Three months later, he married Ruth Hempel at First Lutheran Church in Pasadena, California. My mother was born and raised in uh, Pasadena. It was right after she graduated from UCLA, where she was a classmate of the legendary Jackie Robinson. I was also born and raised in Pasadena, and I also went to UCLA. While I was there, I was a classmate of Lou Elson, Lou Elsinder, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So those are good times to go to UCLA to watch basketball. My dad was born in Norfolk, Nebraska, and then he moved to California with his family right before he started high school. A few months later, on December 7th, uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the United States was at war. Well, my mother was very scared, the, the future was very uncertain, so she decided to go up to visit my dad in Washington over Christmas. And nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. 
Well, at the time, my dad was concerned how was he going to support his family. He has a new bride, a baby on the way, and he didn't think he could do that very well on a private's pain in the Army. So he decided to join the Air Force where he could make more money, especially if he could make it through pilot training uh, and become an officer. So in June of 1942, he went through pre-flight training in Santa Ana, California, and then went through the various stages of pilot training. This slide's a little busy. Uh, it shows you the three main stages of pilot training. First is primary, then if you graduated from primary, you went into basic pilot training. And pilot training was really tough. 40% of the cadets that entered washed out, either became bombardiers or navigators or perhaps gunners. Then after basic, they separated the pilots out. They either went into single engine planes or fighters or twin engine uh, planes, bombers or transports. Uh, typically the shorter pilots went into fighters because of the cramped conditions in the cockpit. My dad was six foot three, they, so they stuck him into twin engine planes. But personally, I think it was also based on personality. Uh, to me, the fighter pilots tended to be pretty uh, independent, have big egos, be pretty cocky, uh, whereas the bomber pilots tended to be a little more level-headed and team players. Yeah. My dad graduated, well, well, this is a picture of my dad in uh, primary training in Santa Maria, California. This was a huge day for him because it was the first time he soloed. I mean, he can always tell by the fact that he's wearing his goggles on his helmet. You couldn't put your, wear your goggles on your helmet until you had soloed. Uh, you see him smoking, I think everyone smoked back then. Uh, I don't know, there we go. And these are the three planes he flew in pilot training. In primary up top is an old Stearman biplane that you see out here. And then in basic uh, training, a Volte-Valiant single wing plane. And then in advanced training, there was a Curtis Wright uh, AT-9 uh, twin engine plane. He graduated from pilot training in April of 1943 uh, in Douglas, Arizona, where he earned his commission as a second lieutenant and received his pilot's wings. And then he went through transitional training where he learned how to fly a four-engine B-17 bomber. And then from there he went to uh, Dalhart, Texas for operational training where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then once deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations. My dad and his re crew reported to the 306 Bomb Group at Thurlai, England on October 21st of 1943. They were a replacement crew for the second Swinefurt mission. That's what the base looked like at the time. It's no longer there. Although the airstrip's still there, they made it into a, a more modern day RAF uh, airstrip. There is a nice little museum there though that my wife and I have visited a, a couple times. Here you see the insignia of the 306 bomb group. Uh, there were three uh, air divisions in the, in the 8th Air Force. Uh, the first air division was uh, signified by a triangle, second air division by a circle, and the third air division by a square. And then every bomb group had a designated letter assigned to them, which was the H for the 306. Um, in addition to being the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany, the 306 was the longest serving bomb group in the 8th Air Force. They arrived in uh, September of 1942 and they didn't go back home until December of 1946. They stayed on after the war involved in the aerial photo mapping of Western Germany and Northern Africa called the Casey Jones Project. Most all of you have seen the 1949 movie 12 O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. Well, that was based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. The fictitious bomb group in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying the 306 by three. <laughs> Another distinction uh, of the 306 bomb group is that their flight surgeon, Dr. Thurman Schuler, was responsible for convincing 8th Bomber Command, uh, Commander Ira Ecker to implement a mission limit in April of 1943. Up until that point, there was no mission limits, and these combat crews quickly learned that they'd never make it home. They'd either be killed or they'd be shot down and become prisoners of war. Uh, Dr. Schuler uh, suggested a mission limit of 20, Acre set it at 25, but at least these combat crews had a light at the end of the tunnel and a target they could shoot for and some hope that maybe they'd be able to make it back home. 
Every bomb group had four bomb squadrons. See, these are four bomb squadrons in the 306 up in the upper left of the clay pigeons, so named by a journalist in England because of the horrendous losses that they took. And then the eager beavers uh, down to the lower left, the grim reapers, and then my dad's squadron, the 369th fight and biting. I always like to point out the ground crew. These combat crews got all the recognition and all the glory, but if there's a, these ground crews that kept these planes flying. After a mission, these bombers would come back all banged up, and these uh, ground crews would stay up all night long, usually in very inclement weather, sleet, ice, rain, snow, trying to get these bombers ready to go back out, uh, repairing battle damage, doing maintenance on the plane, replacing tires, replacing engines. And they took great pride in these bombers. Uh, they considered these bombers their plane. They just lend them out, or loaned them out to the combat crews occasionally to let them fly missions. So they were really the unsung heroes. Here you see my dad's crew, uh, B-17 had a 10-man crew. Uh, four officers, this is my dad on the lower left, he was the first pilot and as such the commander of the plane and the crew and then going across you have the co-pilot, the navigator and the bombardier and then six, six enlisted men uh, behind them who were mainly gunners. Five of these men came back but five of them did not. Uh, that's not the Susan Ruth, that's just a B-17 that they took their crew picture in front of when they arrived in England. I always like to point out the nose art. I love the nose art. Uh, it's interesting that the Air Force was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. The, Air, the Marines didn't, the Navy didn't, but the Air Force thought they could help the morale of these young guys if they could personalize their planes and paint their planes. And they were very creative in what they painted and uh, named their planes. You know, many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a scantily clad or a nude woman. You know, after all, these guys were in their uh, late teens and early 20s and very young men. Uh, the 306 flew B-17s, the 1st Air Division and 3rd Air Division flew B-17s and the 2nd Air Division flew B-24 Liberators. Uh, it was, B-17 was nicknamed the Flying Forest because of the armament that had on, its, on the plane. It had 12 to 13 50 caliber machine guns so they could put out a tremendous amount of firepower. Also, it could take a tremendous amount of battle damage and keep flying. Uh, every plane uh, had tail markings to identify them. As you can see, the Triangle H of the 1st Air Division and the, third, uh, the 306 Bomb Group. And then every plane had a, a personalized number that was assigned by the uh, manufacturer. The Boeing company designed the B-17 and produced 60% of the B-17s, but Lockheed Vega and the Douglas Aircraft Company each produced 18% as well. There were three different models of B-17s flown in the European theater of operations. Uh, the first was the E model, but they only manufactured 500 of those, so they were quickly phased out by the F model. And then eventually the F model was phased out uh, and the G model came in, the definitive really uh, B-17 in the fall of 1943. And you can always tell the, the G model by the chin turret uh, underneath the nose of the plane. Here you see the crew positions on the plane. Again, this is the G model with the chin turret. You have the navigator, the bombardier, the two pilots, flight engineer, the bomb bay, radio operator, a ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and then the tail gunner. And the bombs hung up in racks in the bomb bay, uh, which was really a tight area. That catwalk's only eight inches wide, and that boy's only eight inches old, eight years old. So you can see how cramped it was in there. And on bomb runs, occasionally those bombs would get hung up on the racks, which would require one of the crew members to either kick it loose with his foot or take a wrench and knock it loose. And when those bomb bay doors are open, you're looking five miles straight down to the ground, so it took a little courage to do that. Here you see the crew positions a little more clearly. This is the F model without the chin turret. Again, in the nose, you have the bombardier. Obviously, he needed to bop, drop, drop the bombs accurately, but in the G model, if they were under, under attack by enemy fighters, he manned the, the chin turret. Then you had the navigator that needed to know where they were and where they were going, but under attack, he manned the cheek guns that were on each side of the nose. 
and above them you have the two pilots, first pilot in the left seat, co-pilot in the right seat. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes and not just because if one was killed or injured you had another pilot that could do the job. But these missions lasted six to ten hours in length and it was very strenuous both mentally and physically to fly these planes. Back then it took muscle to fly these planes, not like today that everything's computerized. Uh, they flew in tight formation so these pilots had to stay uh, alert at all times. They could run into a, or clip the wing on a plane next to them or run into a bomber in front of them and go down. Also they had to continually fight the turbulence. Uh, you had the weather turbulence which all of us have experienced in regular commercial flight. But they also had to fight the turbulence of all those bombers being in such close proximity to one another. So the uh, wake turbulence and the prop wash of all those bombers being in the same area would just churn the air up to make it like almost like a, a washing machine. Then above them you had the flight engineer, also called the crew chief. He was kind of the onboard mechanic and knew how everything operated. And he would help monitor uh, the instruments in the plane. There were over 250 different gauges, dials, toggles, and switches in the cockpit. And the flight engineer would peer over the pilot's shoulders to help monitor engine performance and fuel consumption. And then behind the bomb bay you had the radio operator, which is the most comfortable position in the plane. He had a roomy compartment and a chair to sit in. And then the most cramped position in the plane, the ball turret gunner uh, down below. And again, this, these missions were six to ten hours in length, so to being in that fetal position for lengthy periods of time was very uncomfortable. And then above the ball you have the two waist gunners, which are most exposed positions on the plane, and then another cramped position, the tail gunner. My dad flew his first mission on November 3rd of 1943, a mission to Wilhelmshaven. It was the first time that the 8th Air Force put up over 500 bombers on a mission. And flying combat missions were brutal and extremely dangerous. Like Brent said, 26,000 men died in the 8th Air Force, which is more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. And another 28,000 men became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky, either by German aircraft fighters or air fighters or uh, anti-aircraft fire. And it was dangerous from the time they took off to the time they landed. Uh, to begin with, at the uh, peak, uh, the 8th Air Force had 40 bomb groups uh, located in and around an area called East Anglia, which was about the size of Vermont. And these bases were located about five to ten miles apart. So on the day of a mission you could have hundreds of bombers all taking off at the same time. And back then there was no air traffic control, there was no radar. Uh, usually the weather was socked in and they couldn't see anything until you got above the cloud layer. So mid-air mid collisions were not uncommon. And then they had to form up. Individual planes formed up into three plane elements. Elements formed up into bomb squadrons. Bomb squadrons formed up into bomb groups. Bomb groups formed up into combat wings. Combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all this took an hour to two hours before they could even begin the mission across the English Channel. Next thing they had to deal with were the elements. Uh, these planes weren't pressurized, so above 10,000 feet they had to go on oxygen or else they'd pass out in a couple minutes and could die. And also it was extremely cold at the altitudes that they flew, minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. So frostbite was a huge problem and many airmen were hospitalized for lengthy periods of time because of serious frostbite injuries. Uh, one of my dad's waste gunners were hospitalized for two and a half months. Here you see the combat uniform of, uh, this is a waste gunner. Um, on top is steel helmet, tinted goggles, his oxygen mask, and his flak jacket. That was an apron that had metal plates in the front and the back to help protect them. And their uh, fleece line jacket, pants, thermal gloves, and boots. And this is a parachute harness. They didn't actually wear their parachutes in the plane because it was too cramped. It was more cramped in a B-17 than it was in a submarine. So if they needed to bail out, they had to have their wits about them to find their parachute and clip it on hooks on the back of the harness and then the bail out of the plane. Again, you'll notice the uh, creative nose art uh, on this bomber. That's actually a B-24. 
Hey Steve, would they have to take that flat vest off to put on their parachute, or could it hook onto that flat vest? They would take it off. They, they'd have to yeah, yeah. take that off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next thing they had to deal with was enemy aircraft. Uh, the Germans had radar stations set up along the continental coast of Europe so they knew when these bomber formations were coming and they'd send up their air force, the Luftwaffe, to intercept them. You can see again a waste gunner firing his 50 caliber machine gun again with this flak jacket on. These are spent cartridges down here, that's like stepping on ball bearings or marbles. Uh, the ammunition came in belts that were 27 feet in length. So if you fired the whole belt, they said, he fired the whole nine yards. At the beginning of the, the air war, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these heavily armed bombers flying in tight formations of hundreds of bombers could defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. And they flew in what was called a combat box formation. This is the combat box of a wing. And then within the box of the wing, you have three boxes representing bomb groups. And then with each bomb group box, you have three more boxes representing bomb squadrons. So the theory was that all this interlacing firepower could ward off the Luftwaffe. Here you see another view of the, of the, the formation from the, from the back, from on top, and then from the side. It was a three-dimensional formation with a lead group, a high group, and then a low group. Unfortunately, Bomber Command was sorely mistaken when they thought that these bombers could defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. They could not. And even when they gave them a fighter escort, the fighters at the time didn't have the fuel capacity to escort the bombers deep into Germany and escort them all the way back. They could get across the English Channel into continental Europe a little ways, but then they'd run low on fuel and have to turn around and head back to their bases in England. Well, the Luftwaffe would just wait until the fighters, you Allied fighters, went back to their bases and then they'd swoop in on, on these bomber formations. In the early years of the war, the 8th Air Force took devastating losses. Uh, the worst year was 1943. Even though they implemented that 25 mission limit, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions in 1943. The average number of missions flown before being shot down was only six. And the losses culminated in October of 1943, known as Black Week, when over four missions, they lost 148 bombers. That's almost 1,500 men. With the worst day being October 14th, Black Thursday, when 262 B-17s hit the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt, Germany, and 60 of those bombers were shot down. 10 of the 15 B-17s at the 306 sent up that day were lost. Well, the 8th Air Force was in shock after this, so there's no way they could sustain those types of losses, and they seriously dis, uh, considered discontinuing daylight bombing. Uh, they pretty much just st stood down for the remainder of the year and flew no missions into Germany. It wasn't until right at the end of 43 and the beginning of 44 when external fuel tanks were added to the P-47 Thunderbolts and the introduction of the P-51 Mustang that these bomber formations finally had fighters that could escort them deep into German Germany all the way to the target and then escort them all the way back. Uh, the P-51 Mustangs were very effective. They basically wiped out the Luftwaffe and uh, not only gained air uh, superiority but also air supremacy by the time D-Day rolled around. Next thing they had to deal with was uh, anti-aircraft fire. This is a flak gun. Flak was the abbreviation for the German word for aircraft defense cannon. And these were deadly weapons. They fired 20 shells a minute, and these shells were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that these bomber formations were flying. The shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of a razor sharp metal called shrapnel. So when the shells exploded, it, the shrapnel would burst out hundreds of feet and easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. It was so skin you could take a screwdriver, just poke it right through it. From a distance, these, these shells exploding look like innocent black puffs, but as these bomber formations got into this killing field, those puffs got bigger, the explosions got louder, and an uh, exploding shell was near their, their aircraft, it would just violently rock the ship. 
My dad said that even though it was so cold at that altitude, he'd be perspiring profusely and be wringing wet with sweat because of the adrenaline running through his system. When they neared the target, uh, they reached a predetermined point where they started their bomb run. It was called the IP or initial point. And at that time, the first pilot would give control of the plane over to the bombardier who would fly the plane through the Norden bomb site that was tied into the autopilot. This was a revolutionary device at the time. It was an analog computer that could calculate various factors such as the altitude the plane was flying, the speed of the plane, wind speed, wind direction, so they could accurately drop the bombs. It was highly uh, secretive. The bombardiers had to take an oath that they'd defend this with their life, but little did the U.S. know at the time that the Germans had a spy in the Norden bombsite factory, Hermann Lang, and they knew everything about the Norden bombsite. Hermann Lang was eventually arrested and uh, spent 18 years in prison. Here you see the bombardier looking through the crosshairs of the Norden bombsite. When he released the bombs, he'd yell, bombs away! and that would signal the first pilot to take control of the plane back again. And he'd make a big turn and go to another pre-designated point called a rally point, where the various, where the bombers who made it through the formation would try to, made it through the bomb run, excuse me, would try to form up again and then head back to their bases in England where once again they'd have to face enemy fighters. And even when they got back to England, they faced all sorts of dangers. Uh, the weather could be fogged in, they couldn't find their bases, they could be running out of fuel, uh, they could have seriously injured airmen on board, uh, they could have uh, very bad battle damage, they could have engines out, flight controls shot out, uh, landing gear that wouldn't come down, brakes that wouldn't work. But once again, you know, crash landings would occur and more airmen would lose their lives. It was on a mission to Frankfurt, Germany on February 8th of 1944, where by dad's plane, the Susan Ruth drops its bombs successfully, but their bomb bay doors got hit by flak and they couldn't get them back up. And as a result, that caused a drag in the plane. They started losing airspeed and they fell behind the bomber formation heading back to England. And like wolves or lions on prey, uh, two German Focke Wolf 190 fighters uh, uh, swooped in on the Susan Ruth and attacked it and the ensuing air battle the Susan Ruth was shot down. Two of the crew members were killed in the plane the other eight were able to bail out successfully but both those Focke fighters were shot down. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick his plane crashed and he died in the plane and the other plane was piloted by Hans Berger who was able to bail out and made it through the war. One day when I was doing my research, my wife Glenda goes, well, why don't you try to find the pilot that shot down your dad's plane? And I'm thinking, oh, she's naive. She has no idea what she's talking about. It's a stupid idea. I'll never be able to find him. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. And I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war and speaks perfect English. And he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. He was scared to death every time he went up. Uh, I'm sorry, Steve. When did he become a pilot? Like, you know, did he, was he from 41? Oh, no, he didn't start flying until 43. 43. Yeah, war, right. A lot of the German guys just didn't make it. Well, most, they die? most all of his friends died in the war. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Fascinating. Um, as I mentioned, eight members of the crew uh, came down, and the book goes into detail about what happened to the other seven. Uh, some became prisoners of war, some evaded capture, some were killed on the ground. Um, but you'll have to read the book to find out their stories. <laughs> My dad, after he bailed out, he came down to some trees right at the French-Belgium border. And his parachute got hung up at the branches and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and he couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple young Belgian men, Henri Franken and Raymond Dervan, came to his rescue before the Germans got there. Uh, this picture was sent to my dad after the war by uh, Henry Franken. There's over 200 time period photographs in the book, so you can visualize everything you're reading about, many of them taken by Belgian people during the war. 
Here you see Henri Franken standing next to the tree that he helped my dad down uh, from. This occurred in the early afternoon and uh, they told my dad to stay put and they'd come back at night to get him because they thought it was too dangerous to try to move him in daylight with German patrols combing the area. So that night they came back and, and got him and they took him to the Devan farmhouse. That farmhouse is in Belgium but those trees are in France so it's right at the Belgian border. And that house is just one of the many locations that are still there today. He stayed there one night because again they thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that with those German patrols still combing the area. So the following night a Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilken, came on a tandem bicycle to take him to a sec uh, safer location. It was the middle of the night, uh, pitch black, uh, raining, so they started out. My dad had some shrapnel wounds as one of his legs so he could only pedal uh, with his good leg as the pedal came around. But they came to a hill and they couldn't pedal the bike up it anymore so they started pushing the bike up the hill. When they got up to, up to the top of the hill they came to this building. Uh, that's what it looked like in 1994. <laughs> uh, the lights were on, music was playing, people were laughing, talking loudly and all of a sudden two German officers come out with these young girls and one of them puts his arm around my dad and asks for a light for a cigarette. <laughs> my dad couldn't speak German and at that time he couldn't speak French yet. But fortunately, Paul knew what was going on, knew what the German officer wanted, and he lit a cigarette, and they let him go in their way. My dad said he, they were too drunk, or as he put it, schnockered, and too interested in these young girls to pay much attention to a couple of guys pushing a bike up the road in the middle of the night. And after that, he was moved from place to place to place. How long he stayed in any given location depended on how brave the P Belgian people were who lived there and how brave the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might spend one night, he might spend six weeks. And the people who helped my dad were unbelievably brave people, or any down nearman for that matter. Uh, here you see uh, some of the people who helped my dad. Many more people helped him than this. Uh, you can say they stuck a beret on him so he'd kind of try to hopefully blend in with the locals, but at six foot three he was quite a bit taller than uh, any of them. But as I was saying, these people were unbelievably brave. They, they risked not only their lives but the lives of their family and friends because if the German secret police found out about it, they would be arrested, tortured, and either sent to a concentration camp or shot. And some of the Belgian people that helped my dad and other members of his crew did meet that fate. Here you see a couple women that he stayed with lengthy periods of time. On the left is Ghislaine Bayou. It was with her and her husband Maurice that he wrote his diary. And on the right is Jeanette Gedin. Uh, her husband was actually a captain in the French army who was captured in uh, 1940 when Germany first invaded the lowlands and he became a POW for the remainder of the war. But it was very stressful for my dad too uh, in hiding and there are several instances described in the book where he was almost, almost discovered. Uh, normally when the underground came across down airmen they tried to get him back to England through various escape routes down through France over the Pyrenees into Spain and then out through British control Gibraltar but something always went wrong trying to get my dad out and he became really frustrated and uh, got tired of hiding. Uh, word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on June 6th so he decided to get back in the fight and join the French resistance. Uh, his helpers tried to talk him out of it because it was very dangerous. He could either die fighting against the Germans with the resistance or if they captured him he'd be shot on the spot uh, as a terrorist. But he was determined to get back in the fight. Unlike most airmen, he had that year's training in the infantry so he knew how to fight on the ground. So he just persuaded one of his helpers Oh, I forgot about this. I was saying he almost got discovered on a couple different uh, occasions. On one occasion, it was at the Bayou House in Charleroi. But one night, there was pounding on the, on the door, and Maurice told him to get up on the roof and hide up there until the threat was gone and the Germans had left the area. Well, the Germans never left the area that night. My dad spent the entire night on that roof. 
And you can't see it from this angle, but I've been in this house and been uh, up, not on the roof, but in the attic. In the attic, there's a real small window you can just barely crawl out of. And that roof is a tile roof, and it's have a steep pitch. I can't, it's just scary, you know, I just look scary trying to climb up there, let alone spending the whole night up there. But as I said, he got tired of hiding, and he convinced one of his uh, helpers, Amy Cools, to uh, escort him on they rode bicycles across the border uh, in uh, France where he hooked up with a unit of the French resistance called the Mackie. This is not the unit my dad was with, but it gives you an idea of what the French resistance guys look like. Uh, the Mackie were made up of small independent uh, guerrilla groups all across France, and their job was to harass the Germans. They'd uh, attack convoys, disrupt communications, sabotage railroad lines, assassinate German officers, and they got their instructions from the British over coded messages on the BBC. And my dad said if they said a German convoy, convoy would be coming down this road on this day at this time, sure enough, they'd be there. And that was a result of the British cracking the German Enigma code and knowing that everything that, that they were up to. Uh, his group was led by a French lieutenant who had escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. There were a few Frenchmen, some Belgians, and some Algerians who my dad said were real vicious fighters. Uh, they were also supplied by the British through airdrops. <clears throat> this is a farmhouse that they stayed in in Wallers, France. Uh, this picture was taken in 1994. That's my dad standing in front of the of the farmhouse. He stayed in this tower up here where the, in these, these two windows are. One morning, uh, early morning, he was shaving. He had shaving cream in his face, just had his skivvies on, and he saw a German patrol coming up the road. So he had to jump out the, jump out the back of the farmhouse and hightail it into the, the woods to avoid being captured. And again, there's several uh, encounters that they had with the German attacking convoys uh, that, are, that are in the book. Uh, who took this picture and how I got back to my dad, I'll never know, but this is him fighting with the resistance in 1944. Yeah. Finally, seven months after bailing out, word came that there were U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So my dad walked into town into the village square, went up to an army major. Actually, it was an element of Patton's 3rd Army, which had come up through France after D-Day. Uh, they interrogated to make interrogated him to make sure that he was who he said he was. Then he hopped on a, a ride with a, on a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris and then hopped on a transport and got back to England where he sent a Western Union telegram to my mother saying, fit is a fiddle, honey, bank the money, because he had all that back pay coming from missing in action. <laughs> Were they paid or <laughs> No one was getting the money at that time. Not while he was missing in action. Really? Yeah, because he might have been dead. Yeah, so she was, she was on her own then? Yeah. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, it was really tough on my mom because my other sister was born while my dad was missing in action. So here she's back home with a one-year-old, you know, Susan, Ruth, and then uh, Nancy, who lives in Atlanta, who I'm visiting here. Uh, was an inf infant baby at the time. So my dad didn't know whether he had a boy or a girl until he got back to England. How much money was it? He had to know. I don't, you know, I, I should know that, but I don't remember. It's probably in the book. <laughs> Read the book. Read the book. Find the book. A true sale. Exactly. Before I wrote that book, I had a 40 year career in sales and sales management. <laughs> Belgium is a fascinating little country. A lot of people don't realize it's really divided in two. The upper portion is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch, and the lower portion is called Wallonia, where they speak French. And uh, my dad and the plane and the crew, they came down right around here. This is where most all the action took place. My dad was hidden in Charleroi for a while, and then that farmhouse where the French resistance group stayed in Trelon, France, where he was liberated, is right around here. And the Belgian people are wonderful people. To this day, they are still so thankful and so grateful for the Allies and the and Americans coming to their rescue and liberating them from four years of Nazi occupation and Nazi uh, oppression. And they do a great job of educating the younger generations to honor and, and remember uh, those as well. In 1984, Dr. Paul Delahaye, who I showed you earlier, uh, formed a 
the Belgium American Foundation to remember and honor the, the US uh, servicemen that liberated their country. And they erected a number of memorials in the area on the anniversary of those events. They have celebrations or ceremonies. But the big ceremonies are all centered around September 2nd, which was when that area uh, was first liberated uh, by the US armies. And they're wonderful, wonderful events. Uh, they last several days. That's a poster from the 70th anniversary. Uh, they erect these big tents that seats hundreds of people. That's just a portion of one tent. Uh, they have band, band concerts, dances, lunches, uh, dinners. Uh, they're just really fun events. The local people uh, dress up in, in period costumes. They have a U.S. military vehicle parade. They set up a U.S. Um, army encampment. Uh, the local beer chamay just flows and everyone has a real good time. But they have more uh, you know, serious moments. Uh, this is a ceremony that they have at Sundron, which is right at the French-Belgian border where the 60th Regiment of the 9th U.S. Infantry first crossed over from France over the Wartois River uh, to liberate that town. And all the local villagers come out, all the dignitary, local dignitaries make speeches. Uh, the U.S. military is there, the Belgian military, the French military, the U.S. ambassador to Belgium comes down with an entourage. Uh, they're just really moving and as you can see here again all these young people in the front row again emphasize the importance of the event. This is the memorial that they erected to my dad and his crew in the little village of Mackinwas which is near where the plane uh, came down. Uh, this was erected in 1989. And prior to that, my dad, like most World War II veterans, didn't talk very much about the war. But he and the three other crew members that were still living at the time went over for the dedication. And there he was reunited with all these people that hit him during the war, visited these places where he stayed, and that brought it all back, and he started talking about it. And then my first trip to Belgium was five years later, 1994, when I accompanied my parents to Belgium, and that's when it became personal for me, because I saw all these places uh, firsthand, was able to meet uh, a couple of his helpers. I've been to Belgium six times. Uh, on two of those occasions, I, I, I continued, but before I show that slide, uh, this is at the dedication ceremonies in 1989. This is Dr. Paul Delahaye, my dad. This is Jeanette Gadin, who I showed you in that earlier picture. Uh, this is Nellie Tilcan, the wife of that Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan. Two months after he helped my dad, he was arrested by the Gestapo, uh, sent to prison, tortured, and just narrowly escaped being executed. But he died at a fairly young age because of the torture and treatment that he uh, suffered. This is my dad here. That's Jeanette Gadin, Nellie Tilcan, and then this is Raymond Durvan, who is that other Belgian man that helped my dad down from the trees after he bailed out. As I was mentioning on two occasions, I've continued over to uh, Munich, Germany to visit that German Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad, Hans Berger. Interestingly enough, of all the people that are involved in the shot down story, Hans is the only one still living. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, today, he turned 98 years old. Wow. Did, he, did he autograph that book for you? Yes, he did. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I autographed one for him. But, yeah. Uh, this is us uh, at his apartment in Munich. He's wearing his uh, fighter jacket. He has his iron cross on here. It's kind of hard to see. Han shot down seven B-17s and one Spitfire. He was shot down three times himself. Uh, like we were saying, most uh, all of his friends were killed in the war. And the only reason I think he made it through the war that in early 1995, they pulled him out of combat to make him a test pilot for the Heinkel HE-162 single engine jet fighter that they were trying to uh, perfect, which they never did. But pulling him out of combat, combat at the beginning of 45, I think is what saved his life. Where, where did he settle in Germany at, Hostie? He's in Munich. Munich? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was originally from Dresden. Okay. 
Yeah. And this is at the, at the Hofbrauhaus House in, in Munich, enjoying a cold wind. And Hans and I have become good friends. Did your dad ever meet you? No, my dad died in 07. Uh, I didn't decide to write the book until 2012. Right. Okay. I got you. So unfortunately, they never met. That would have been something if I could have sat yeah, there and listened to them, yeah. them to, con to converse. Is he a hero in Germany? Like, does, is he honored? No. Yeah. No. Huh? I will tell you, Sean, that most of the fighter pilots in Germany were not heroes. They were considered rogues because the German population felt that they had let down the Germans by letting all the B-17s and B-24s bomb them. So if you were a fighter pilot after World War II, you were treated with disdain. Most of them left the country because they were treated with such a, so poorly uh, by the uh, population. It's a very fortunate. I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah, actually, Hans, uh, well, I'm kind of getting off the subject here, but at the end of the war, any uh, German uh, military person had to go back to their hometown. So he had to go back to Dresden, which at the time was controlled by the Russians, East Germany. And one day a friend of his who was a doctor told him that he found out that the Russians were going to arrest him that night and send him to Siberia. So his, he risked his life crossing you know, over from uh, East Germany into West Germany. And he learned how to speak English and he actually worked for the U.S. occupational forces in the denazification of the German youth. And then he started a translation school uh, after that. But Hans and I have become good friends. Uh, to my way of thinking, he was pretty much just like the U.S. airman. He was 19, 20 years old, fighting for his country, trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. Um, the World War II was the defining moment of my dad's life. And at one point in time, Hans' life and my dad's life crossed paths. So he's a part of my dad's story, a part of my dad's life. And. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll ever get, if I'll be able to get back to Germany to see him before he passes, but uh, it, it's really been an exciting experience getting to know Hans. This picture of me and my dad was taken in 2004. He wanted to see the World War II memorial before he died, so I accompanied him on a reunion trip to the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society. He went down to, uh, this picture was taken right before the official dedication, and that was the last trip he ever took. Uh, he died in 2007. He wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest crew member to die at 91. And all the World War II veterans are in their mid-90s now or, or in early hundreds. At the end of the war, there were 16 million World War II veterans. And as this graph indicates, you know, that number has been dwindling rapidly. There's only about 2% of these special men still with us. There was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died, millions more were wounded, millions more were left homeless and, and displaced. It changed the course of America and the world forever. And the brave young men who fought and died for freedom can never be forgotten. It's our duty to remember. Thank you.